Well, thank you. Aloha. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you to the Japan Society and a special thanks to everyone's most treasured sensei, Don Zagoria, and the folks at the National Committee on American Foreign Policy for making this possible. I guess we should also thank Kim Jong-un for making it necessary. And uh, we're going to uh, dispense with uh, opening comments and dispense with introductions. You have a piece of paper in front of you that tells you who everyone is. Uh, so we're going to get right into the meat of the discussion. Uh, and I'm going to start, David, with you if I can. Uh, we, as we've been discussing in our, in our conference the last couple of days, uh, in many respects there's been more continuity than change in American foreign policy in Asia. Uh, President Trump during his visits uh, reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to Japan and Korea, reaffirmed the one China policy. Uh, many people have said even the uh, extreme pressure uh, policy on North Korea is very similar to strategic patience, perhaps strategic patience on steroids, uh, some have described it, or strategic patience only louder. Uh, and certainly today, as we listen to uh, the U.S. going in position uh, on the uh, talks uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, the favorite old phrase, CVID, uh, has returned, complete, verifiable, uh, irreversible uh, denuclearization or dismantlement of, of North Korea's capabilities. Uh, so what's changed? Why should we be any more hopeful that things will uh, work out better this time, or is, as that great American philosopher and New Yorker Yogi Berra once said, it's deja vu all over again. David. Thank you very much, Ralph, and thanks to the Japan Society for uh, having us tonight. Can, can um, everyone hear? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, but before I, before I answer the question, I, I just want to say that in addition to my day job at McClarty Associates, I'm the chairman of the board of the National Association of Japan America Societies. There are 37 Japan America Societies uh, throughout the United States, and my association uh, based in Washington is an umbrella organization that sort of knits them all together. And I think these societies, including this one right here, play a critical role in promoting U.S.-Japan relations, and it's more important now than it ever has been. So thanks again for having us. Um, with regard to the question, I want to I uh, address two parts of it. One, the overall environment, what's different about the overall environment, say, uh, compared to 10 years ago, and what's different between this administration and the last administration. With regard to the environment, the first big change is that North Korea has nuclear weapons that it can deliver to the continental United States, or will soon be able to do so. Uh, this changes the strategic equation on the Korean Peninsula. It threatens uh, uh, American escalation dominance in a crisis. It threatens the American extended deterrent uh, that we extend to our allies, South Korea and Japan. Um, and it, uh, it offers the possibility that um, the, the North Koreans can blackmail the South Koreans into, say, reunifying the peninsula more on North Korea's terms than on South Korea's terms. So. Again, this, this changes the strategic equation on the peninsula, and it has, I think, uh, added a lot of uncertainty and potential uh, instability, instability uh, to the region as a whole. The second difference is that China is not only rising, it's risen. China is translating its uh, great economic wealth into more diplomatic and uh, military power. We have some common interests with the Chinese in Northeast Asia, particularly with regard to denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, but there are areas where our interests diverge, and I think over the longer term, the Chinese would like to see a diminished presence um, on the Korean Peninsula, a diminished military presence, uh, diminished uh, influence throughout Northeast Asia. A third difference is that the U.S. is changing. Um, uh, President Trump's America First uh, policy, I think, also has injected a lot of uncertainty into the region. He has questioned the value of our alliances. He has divorced uh, regional economic and trade policy from our security policy, treating them in these two areas in very different ways. Um, he has pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership multilateral free trade agreement. Um, and again, this has uh, injected a lot of uncertainty into the region. 
Um, a third uh, difference is that uh, Japan is no longer a rear area in the event of a Korean War. It used to be that Japan was a safe haven for US forces in the event of a Korean War because the North Koreans couldn't touch Japan. Now they can reach out and touch Japan with intermediate, intermediate range nuclear missiles that could have conventional warheads, they could have nuclear warheads. Um, when I was uh, in the US Embassy in Tokyo in the 1990s and we started talking to the Japanese about um, uh, uh, a war on the Korean Peninsula, we treated Japan as a rear support base. That ch changed drastically in the mid, early to mid 2000s. Finally, um, uh, a big difference between now and a few years ago is that the uh, Republic of Korea has a left of center government. President Moon wants to be more independent of the alliance. He, he values the alliance. He greatly values the continued US military presence there. But he wants to be a little more independent. He wants to be closer to China, and he wants to implement a rapprochement with the North Koreans. This is very different from his conservative pr uh, predecessor. Um, and it has, it has not only helped lead to uh, a Trump-Kim summit, but it has also uh, 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 complicated uh, alliance management for the United States um, uh, to some extent. So th th that's the way in which the uh, uh, overall environment has changed. The big difference between this administration and the previous administration is that uh, the Trump administration has gone with maximum pressure. I think if the Democrats, if, if uh, Hillary Clinton had won the presidency, she would have done the same thing. That's where the Obama administration was heading as well. This administration is more willing to increase tensions by threatening preemptive military force uh, against uh, North Korea. Uh, the president is more willing to take the risk of meeting with his North Korean counterpart before a negotiation act actually takes place. We normally like the president to put a ribbon on a box uh, filled and wrapped by diplomats. Um, in this case, the president is creating and wrapping the box that will be uh, with the ribbon placed on it by diplomats. So um, that's a very high risk strategy for the president and you may have seen what uh, happened today with the president ex in injecting some uncertainty into the question of whether or not he'll have the summit. So those are all ways in which uh, the, the situation has changed. Good. David, thank you very much. Uh, Duyan, you are living and working in Seoul right now. And uh, you've heard uh, David's description of, of things in Korea, particularly uh, whether or not uh, President Moon is the orchestrator of the, the current uh, summit or facilitator. Uh, what do you think uh, President Moon is hoping to get out of this? What is, what is his desires for this summit? Uh, thanks, Ralph. Uh, I first would like to thank the NCAFP and uh, the Japan Society for having this very timely event and for having us come here to have this conversation with all of you. Uh, in terms of the uh, Moon Jae-in administration's primary interests, uh, really is uh, ultimately peace on the Korean Peninsula. And peace means uh, no nuclear weapons in North Korea. Uh, and peace, and then eventually to get to a point where um, they do realize uh, reunification of uh, the two Koreas. Now, President Moon, he came into office uh, bent on wanting to leave uh, a legacy of being the president who actually brought peace to the Korean Peninsula and the president who was able to finish the unfinished business of his two previous progressive predecessors. Uh, and so for him, the political stakes and the personal stakes are very high. Uh, and the current uh, summitry, and really, uh, you know, President Moon has been driving this the series of um, summitry that we're seeing in the region. Uh, and for you know, there's a lot of news that you're hearing recently in the last few days of will the U.S. North Korea summit happen or not. Um, but for President Moon, um, 
he needs this North Korea US summit to happen eventually. And he also needs to continue this diplomatic process to continue on uh, the nuclear issue uh, in order for him to be able to drive and fully achieve his peace agenda. So he's got this the peace agenda and the denuclearization agenda. And there have been some concerns in the region and even in Washington uh, about how do these two two tracks uh, proceed uh, in, in tandem? Uh, will they uh, coincide? Will they uh, clash uh, at some point? So will the peace agenda move too quickly before the denuclearization agenda? And that's not just a matter of um, President Moon's policies. It's also an issue of other forces in the region, like China, that might uh, want to play a role uh, in this process, whether it is constructive role or a spoiler role. Uh, he also, um, you know, I, I actually do want to touch upon the South Korean public just a little bit sure. too, because I think a lot of that is um, missing in, in, in the international discourse. Uh, the South Korean public at large uh, is very diverse, of course, um, but the broader South Korean public, my sense is that it has grown increasingly skeptical both about North Korea, North Korea's sincerity and genuineness and seriousness about denuclearization, but also increasingly skeptical about how their own government handles uh, North Korea. And this includes um, some of the progressive base, especially among the younger generation. And we've seen some of that play out uh, during the Winter Olympics. Uh, now that said, uh, it is fair to say that all South Koreans do want peace. And, and for South Koreans, peace really means no nuclear weapons uh, in North Korea. Uh, and the current, you know, symmetry that's been taken place, uh, there is a sense of, you know, some of our American colleagues call, who had visited recently in Seoul called it um, euphoria. Uh, others will call it celebratory and festive. Uh, but, you know, even though they've seen, you know, the very um, dramatic um, um, displays on TV, the live broadcasts of the inter-Korean summit, uh, the theatrics and the pageantry, even among uh, the critics and the skeptics, uh, my sense is that South Koreans, they're, they're, they have some mixed feelings when they're watching these um, pictures on TV. Uh, on the one hand, you know, as I said, the, the broader public has grown increasingly skeptical, uh, and so they're not gonna buy into just shows and displays, but at the same time, uh, being Korean, uh, there is a bit of hope that they have. You know, and they see these pictures of the two Korean leaders shaking hands, and that to them shows, you know, it's, it's a glimpse of what a unified Korea might look like in the future. And so there's a bit, there's a lot of mixed feelings really below the surface of all the euphoria, some of our colleagues will call it, and below the surface of um, the, the festivities and the positive atmosphere that's actually being um, felt uh, on the ground in South Korea. Great. Shi Yu, let me go to you next and get a, a Chinese uh, perspective. Uh, President Trump was uh, quoted uh, the other day, and I think again uh, today actually, uh, raising some concerns that maybe North Korea's current hardline policy or, or reticence to come to the summit was because President Xi uh, doesn't really want the summit to happen because it might marginalize China. Uh, what, from your perspective, was that a fair criticism, or what is, what is, China's, what is China's interest in seeing a, a U.S.-North Korea summit continue? Well, firstly, uh, uh, from the two summits in Beijing and Dalian, uh, China really want to see a success of the series of summits, not only uh, summits with China, but also summits with uh, uh, South Korea, the two Korea summit, and also- Move the mic just a little closer, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, we really look forward to the success of the uh, uh, US DPRK summit. Uh, regarding to the uh, the uh, uh, the term you mentioned, uh, Ralph, uh, the marginalized. Uh, I w I have been very strange to hear about this uh, uh, analysis uh, because uh, China always pay special attention to the results rather than the course. For example, through 1993 to the year 2002, almost nine years. U.S. DPRK bilaterally engage uh, on the nuclear issue for nine years. And uh, during the nine years, uh, China had never st uh, stood in the front 
uh, front line. And uh, we were very happy to see every progress made by USDPRK. And we were very concerned about the uh, risks uh, the battle in engagement emerged. So basically, uh, we welcome uh, the positive and active engagement between uh, US and DPRK. Only when the bilateral engagement failed in late 2002, by reasons you know, then China stepped onto the stage. So during the, that nine period, China never, uh, China was never concerned about so-called being marginalized. Uh, what we want is, as I said, we pay special attention to the result. What is the result? We want the denuclearization. Just like Deng Xiaoping said, uh, no matter it's a white cat or black cat, the, the mouse is the key. The mouse is, is important. If the, current, if the current bilateral relation, if the current bilateral engagement between the two Koreas, between DPRK and the USA, can lead to a durable peace and a real denuclearization, China will, be, uh, will, uh, uh, will welcome that. And we will be uh, able to enjoy denuclearization in free of charge. So we, uh, for Beijing, we never have a, a feeling or sense or worry about the marginalized. Uh, during the summits in Dalian and Beijing, Xi Jinping uh, made a lot of work on North Korea to encourage North Korea to engage with the, uh, the United States. We even share our observations and experiences of our engagement with the United States uh, for single purpose, say, access of the upcoming summit of, in Singapore. Thank you. Yuki, let's turn to you uh, for a perspective on Japan. I mean, when, when the summit was announced between uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, almost immediately, Mr. Abe was on a plane flying to Washington to find out what's going on. And a lot of people have talked about how uh, Japan would really rather not see this occur. So what's, from your perspective, what are Japan's interests? And perhaps you could talk a little bit about Japan public opinion as well. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, I also would like to start by uh, thanking uh, National Committee on American Foreign Policy and uh, Japan Society for giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity in this uh, great space. Last time I was in, was in this space, was I was actually accompanying uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshiko Noda when he delivered a speech here several years ago. So I never would have thought that I would be on the stage that he, he gave a speech from that podium. I'm, I'm sitting here, but um, I'm quite honored to be here. Responding to your question, Ralph, um, let me just start out by saying that the Japan generally is in a very tight spot on when it comes to the affairs in the Korean Peninsula. Because Japan is not technically a uh, war party in the uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, Japan has to be a little bit creative if he wants to uh, directly engage or proactively engage in how the conversation about the uh, developments in the Korean Peninsula would, might evolve. But, but even though if it's not a direct party to all this, uh, whatever happens, an ultimate fate of not only the uh, nuclear problem with the North Korea, but what happens ultimately eventually with the Korean unification will have a profound Im impact on Japan's strategic choices moving forward. So given that, um, I do think that uh, news of, uh, news of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump and uh, Mr. Kim's uh, summit uh, startled many in Japan. And then I think uh, we're not too far off uh, by uh, what observing Mr. Abe rushing to uh, come to Washington to talk to uh, Mr. Trump for one reason, which is that the most effective way from Mr. Abe's perspective of having any impact or making sure that Japan's interest in this process is, um, is addressed is through working closely with uh, Mr. Trump. Obviously, uh, Japan wants denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but if the ultimate uh, nuclear agreement, whatever the framework might look like between Mr. Trump and Mr. Kim, does not address other uh, security concerns that Japan actually has been having for the last two decades, which is uh, North Korea's uh, ballistic missile cap uh, medium and short range of ballistic missile capabilities. Japan has been within that range for the last 20 years, lived under it. Uh, 
it's not fully addressing Japan's concerns. So I think uh, first and foremost, any kind of a settlement needs to have that aspect um, adequately addressed as well. But here's what I uh, get into um, into the a uh, little bit of a constraints that uh, Mr. Abe has back home when it comes to North Korea issue, is that the Japan's bilateral relations with North Korea is heavily heavily constrained. It, the two two nations obviously have no diplomatic relations, economic relationship between uh, Tokyo and Pyongyang is close to a nil, um, because of all the economic sanctions, both multilateral and unilateral sanctions Japan has imposed on North Korea. But when it comes to uh, Japan uh, possibly playing a proactive role or having an engagement in the, how the conversation of solving North Korea puzzle, the biggest uh, thing that Japan can offer is the uh, either financial incentive to North Korea or technical assistance to North Korea at, in the process of denuclearization. But because Japan has long held this very firm position that for Japan to have any kind of engagement, positive engagement with North Korea, the issue of the uh, Japanese abductees needs to be fully and completely resolved. So unless Japan, Japan or Prime Minister Abe can find a way of re somehow redefining what that resolution of this abductee issues might look like, Japan is actually taking themselves out of the, uh, taking the, uh, uh, actually giving up the uh, leverage that it could have in this process. And then I think Japanese public opinion is uh, fairly divided on this. And they are uncertain about, there are of course uh, enormous sympathy toward the uh, families, toward abductees' families. But at the same time, because as Dave mentioned, Japan is no longer a rear area when it comes to contingency in the Korean Peninsula. I do think that there is a growing sense that which is more important. Our, this is a matter of, life, matter of life and death issues for us now. So I think uh, public think feelings are still very mixed. Good. Uh, Jim, I won't ask you to channel President Trump, but I, I will ask you, having heard what our, our Japanese, Korean, and Chinese colleagues have said, how aware do you think the administration is of the aspirations of our our friends and allies, and how much will that be a factor, do you think, in the preparations for the summit or the conduct of the summit? No, thank you. That's an excellent question. And I think not only in the preparations for the summit, but during and after the summit as well, um, the coordination with our allies and our, and our partners in the region is very important. Um, you've just heard the um, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese views, which uh, it, wanting to see peace in the area and defining that as an end to North Korea's nuclear program. That's something the United States shares. But I think there's also a recognition that um, from the United States perspective, we need friends and allies in the region in order to achieve these objectives. So I think there'll be a lot of work um, coordinating with our partners. One of the challenges uh, you've just heard uh, on the Korean side, what was described as euphoria or a festive atmosphere and on the Japanese side, tremendous skepticism about the same thing. So we have two allies coming from very different points of view. So one of the big challenges for the United States, I think, will be how do we manage our relationships with these two allies while trying to see if this opening from North Korea is something meaningful. And if obviously, if it is something meaningful, we should be testing out as much as we can to see if there's a way of making progress. If this is not a meaningful opening and North Korea is yet again using these kind of uh, diplomacy to string out uh, others, uh, we need to make sure that this process doesn't damage our relationships with our two allies who are coming from a very different point of view. And likewise with our, our Chinese friends, um, we have some very common interests here. So this is an area where we should be working together and communicating very closely with the Chinese. So I hope what you'll see, I can't speak for the Trump administration, but I hope what you'll see is a very intensive amount of diplomacy both beforehand and afterwards. You're certainly seeing that from both uh, President Moon and Prime Minister Abe, who've both uh, coming to Washington for consultations, lots of phone calls. I think this kind of uh, communications is very important. But this is certainly an era where there'll be an emphasis on diplomacy, and this will be challenging all of our diplomatic skills to manage the relationships that we have with our, th our three partners in the region as we try and pursue uh, peace and security in the region by engaging North Korea. Thank you, Jim. I want to dig a little deeper and, and talk about what would constitute success uh, of the Trump-Kim summit. 
Uh, in doing my homework today, I ran across an article where Du Yan was quoted, uh, and she said, whatever happens, President Trump will declare it a success and then move on. So, uh, but I, I hope we can dig a little deeper than that. And David, I'll, I'll start with you and then come to Du Yan. But I, I know the US has said CVID would be a success, but is there anything well, short of CVID that would still be a success? Well, I agree with Du Yan. I think both President Trump and President Kim are so heavily invested in this in this summit that it'll be a success by definition. But um, I, I think it would be um, miraculously successful for us to achieve complete, verifiable, irreversible, and um, and uh, 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 denuclearization on the peninsula up front. That's what the administration's current position is. We want. We want the North Koreans to give everything up before we start handing out the goodies to the North Koreans. Um, I don't think that's likely. I think the North Koreans will want to engage and have said that they want to engage in a, uh, a, uh, uh, a process that is uh, synchronized between North what the North Koreans do and what the United States does and its allies do as we, as we move uh, along the process. So. Um, I think the realistic, uh, for me, a realistic uh, good outcome would be a joint declaration between the U.S. and North Korea that lays out a set of principles um, relating to denuclearization and what the U.S. will do in response, and that also establishes a process that lays out a roadmap for the complete, ultimate denuclearization of North Korea. Do I, I'd like you to give us a Korean perspective, not necessarily the Korean perspective, since I know there are a lot of different views in Korea. But from your personal view, what would you consider a, quote, successful summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un? Well, I'll give you my personal um, perspective on this. Uh, and if, for those of you who may not have seen, I, I told the New York Times that whatever It'll be a success because President Trump will call it a success, and he'll uh, package it and sell it as that, and it won't really matter too much how we, the experts, really assess um, what comes out of it. Uh, but the, real, the key point is what happens after the summit, what happens to the process after. Uh, I think a good outcome, uh, now all things considered, and I'd be saying something very different if this were a, a different American administration, but all things considered, I think uh, a good outcome would be um, if the two leaders agreed on a very simple vision statement. I say vision statement, uh, David said declaration. I know Gary Seymour in a previous uh, workshop that I was in with him called it a framework agreement. It's, these are semantics, but, um, it, but they're all very similar in, in content. Uh, but a very simple vision statement that um, addressed all parties' key security, political, and economic concerns uh, and created pathways to uh, resolving all of these issues peacefully. And I say this um, more so because I, I would be dis disappointed if it, was, if it was just a nuclear agreement uh, because the nuclear agreement is more than just the science behind the nuclear issue. Um, there are many complex regional issues that are all intertwined into uh, the nuclear issue. Uh, and uh, it would be a very good outcome if the two leaders are able to define what denuclearization really means. Uh, and over the past 25 years, uh, the two sides have had different definitions. And so I think it would be a big mistake and a very big missed opportunity if we just settled for the word denuclearization in the text of an agreement or a declaration uh, without a clear understanding between the two sides and agreement. Uh, on that. And also, you know, I actually would be okay if the two leaders walked away from this particular summit saying, well, we'll meet again. We haven't come to an agreement, but we'll meet again and keep uh, the diplomatic process, the door open and not revert back to escalation because really we want a good deal. The stakes are really high and especially where the North Koreans are in their technical nuclear capability. Uh, th this might actually be the last time we have a chance at a negotiated settlement uh, to the nuclear issue. So let me follow up, Duan. Uh, do you think President Moon would agree with you, or is his aspirations for the summit higher? 
Oh, <laughs> we'll see. We've got some uh, South Korean government colleagues in the room. They might know uh, how better to answer that question, but but they won't. <laughs> <laughs> but they obviously probably won't in a public setting. Uh, you know, I I would suspect that. Um, he would have bigger aspirations. Um, but in terms of just the basic principles, and I like the way David used the word principles in, in, in the upcoming outcome, whatever the document is, uh, I, I, you know, I suspect that um, President Moon would want the basic principles of denuclearization, peaceful resolution. Um, you know, he may even you know, be uh, supportive of you know, normalization of US-North Korea. Uh, relations, but of course, you know the peace treaty and the peace regime element. Uh, so, um, you know, he he seems to be a very ambitious person, rightfully so, and so perhaps his bar is much higher. But I'm trying to be more realistic, all things considered. Good, Chi Yu, yes. uh, from a Chinese perspective, and well, I know you made an interesting analogy about uh, cutting grass as opposed to pulling out roots, and I, maybe you could share that with us uh, well, as well. Uh, yeah, uh, I think. Uh, uh, a powerful consensus between uh, uh, Chairman Kim and President Trump uh, can be uh, can can mark the summit as a successful say uh, consensus one consensus on denuclearization and uh, number two consensus on reduction uh, reduction of tensions and uh, peace and the security on the peninsula. So I think it won't be difficult for the two leaders to reach such a powerful consensus, both the peace and the nuclear. Uh, however, the denuclearization, the consensus, consensus on denuclearization contains uh, a lot of complicated uh, differences and even risks. In my observation, uh, Kim Jong-un has recommitted to the denuclearization, but I'm afraid it could be a, uh, it could be a, um, could be a uh, uh, not pure, complete uh, denuclearization. In Chinese, we call it a zhan chao liu gen. Say, you cut off the grass, all of the grass you cut off, but keep the root on the earth, in the earth. That's a zhan chao liu gen. And the different uh, uh, denuclearization is a zhan chao chu gen. Not only cut off the grass, but also put the root out of the earth. So that, that is what the international community wants. So uh, roughly speaking, the two leaders can, in, in principle, reach the denuclearization as the common ground, uh, not touch on the zhan chao liu gen or not touch on the difference. Uh, so that's why I said it won't be uh, difficult to reach that uh, consensus. And by the same token, for peace, both Pyongyang and Washington want peace. So the difficulty and the risks uh, actually uh, will be the following stages. So after the summit, there could be a bilateral high-level meeting, both the two Koreas and the US DPRK. When they step into uh, the detailed uh, uh, issues relating to the denuclearization and the peace issue, the conf uh, conflicting points, the differences, the contradictions will gradually emerge. So now, I, I, in short term, I'm optimistic, although both Kim Jong-un, uh, uh, although both Pyongyang and Washington, D.C. send some uh, uh, negative signals regarding to the postpone, even cancel the uh, uh, Singapore meeting. But I believe the meeting will certainly be held and the part of the consensus will certainly be reached. But the risks, they won't touch. Uh, that means in the following stages, uh, lots of risks uh, facing ahead. Thank you. Just as a, a follow-up, Xi Yu, do you, do you think that President Xi would be satisfied with a nicely mowed lawn? Uh, and uh, do you think President Trump would be? Well, firstly, uh, China really hope a real uh, denuclearization. That means Zhan Chao Chu Gen. I'm not meaning only North Korea. Uh, for China's view, ideally, the whole peninsula 
should become a nuclear free zone, just like uh, the 92 joint uh, declaration stated uh, by the two Koreas. So that's China's goal. Uh, but uh, at, at the current stage, even the two leaders uh, made uh, the consensus in principle not touching the, the substantive definition, Beijing will be satisfied. We, we look forward the progress uh, step by step. Of course, it will be better if we can solve this uh, nuclear issue overnight, but it's impossible. Yuki, let's start with your personal opinion on what would be a successful summit. Of course, I never uh, represented a Japanese government, so whatever I'm going to say is not my personal opinion. But I think um, from Japanese vantage point, the uh, denuclearization of what is the key? Is it denuclearization of North Korea, or is it denuclearization of Korean Peninsula? Sounds similar, but it means two very different things for Japan. And obviously, Japan prefers to see former in whatever the uh, joint vision or joint statement that may or may not emerge um, following the uh, Trump-Kim summit. And the reason for that is if it's a denuclearization of North Korea, that means no nuclear weapons in North Korea. Improves, uh, uh, improves, uh, improves um, Japan's uh, security, security condition, lessen uh, Japan's security concern, although, like I uh, laid out earlier, there's, there still are remaining concerns about their other conventional uh, cap military capabilities that Japan would be very, very keen to see and addressed. However, when it comes to if, if it's a denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, huge impact on Japanese security posture because it could entail co quite considerable reorganization of U.S. force presence in Korea and what kind of a, what kind of a military capability will U.S. Uh, U.S. may or may not retain after this agreement. And from Japanese vantage point, that is a much less favorable outcome to see. Um, I really like the analogy that uh, Dave put out um, describing this whole upcoming summit, that it's actually the uh, two leaders creating a box. And then I would actually describe it, I would actually see as um, this summit is the opportunity, if it happens, um, opportunity for President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un to create a box and even create the inter inside compartment inside that box on the issues that uh, two countries will focus on. And the content of the box is, will have to be worked out with not only US and North Korea direct negotiations, but with the input from South Korea and also Japan and also, of course, from China. So this is kind of the, we're looking at the, the best outcome that we could potentially see is this empty box with the rough compartmentalization and the actual content of that is uh, still a long, long far off. Another point that Japan would very much like to see if some kind of agreement or consensus can be reached between the two leaders is that whatever the discussion about the uh, ultimate peace, uh, peace set of peace treaty or peace settlement of Korean, uh, Korean War does not, pers does not begin until denuclearization of North Korea process is sufficiently uh, moved forward. So I would just leave it at that. So I think you answered both of my questions and given your personal view, but also saying what you thought the Japanese government would want. So Jim, let me, let me go to you and first of all, get your, your personal view on what would be a successful summit. Thank you very much. I, I think it's important to recognize that this summit is between two leaders, so not everything is up to President Trump. Uh, you can't have a good discussion without two people wanting to have a discussion. So really there's two paths that are possible. One is that uh, Kim Jong-un is sincere in wanting to negotiate some improvements. Uh, the other is that this is a ploy, and he's using this tactically to gain some advantage. And frankly, we don't know which of those two is possible. So the definition of this success is not singular. There are two possible successful outcomes, depending on how Kim is coming in. Um, I think it's very important for President Trump to test whether North Korea is, in fact, sincere. We don't want to, five years from now, be thinking, gee, we missed an opportunity. We really should have, have tested and, made, and seen if Kim was sincere or not. So this is an opportunity to see whether North Korea is, in fact, sincere in trying to negotiate some different future for itself. If, if the answer to that is yes, then obviously 
uh, President Trump should take advantage of that opportunity by building trust, because trust between leaders is important, and negotiating some kind of, as Duyun said, like a vision or a framework or some preliminary document that lays out the leader's vision for the bureaucracies then to follow up on. So that would be success if North Korea is sincere. I'm pretty skeptical that, th that this is more than a ploy, and I think many American uh, officials and people outside government are. But if that's the case, the United States needs to manage the process to be successful. Uh, President Trump has talked about walking out of the room. That's not my definition of success. Success would be managing that kind of process. And so there are three elements to that. The first is the United States needs to manage its relationships with its friends and allies in the region as we proceed. So for example, if President Trump and Kim Jong-un are not able to reach some kind of a framework or vision statement, we need to talk to our very disappointed Republic of Korea friends, our perhaps somewhat relieved Japanese friends, and our Chinese friends, and explain what's going on. Because the second element of our strategy needs to be to continue the economic pressure. And the United States can't do that alone. We have to do that with our friends and allies. So we need these good relationships. And then the third element of managing or a successful outcome, if in case things don't go well, is uh, we need to figure out how we continue our policy of deterring and containing North Korea. And what I mean by deterring is, yes, if uh, they have a nuclear capability and they're capable of threatening Seoul or threatening Tokyo, we need to figure out ways of deterring that and making sure our allies are comfortable with our own uh, nuclear umbrella. But also we need to start thinking about containing North Korea in, in the sense of proliferation because North Korea has been a proliferator in the past and it would be certainly very, very threatening to everyone if we saw that continuing. So we'd want to start conversations with our friends about a deterrence and containment strategy. So that would be a success in the sense that uh, we can't force Kim Jong-un to decide he wants to open his economy and give up his nuclear weapon. That's his choice. And if he hasn't made that choice, uh, I would con consider it successful if we manage our relations with others, continue the pressure policy, and strengthen our deterrence and containment strategy. So a, a quick show of hands from our panel. How many believe that Kim Jong-un is sincere about giving up nuclear weapons? <laughs> All right, a, a quick show of hands from the audience. How many people out there believe that he is sincere about giving up nuclear weapons? See, there's a okay. Are there North uh, Koreans in the audience? <laughs> wow. I, I can't see too well out there, but I certainly didn't see any hands go up. So let's do as the follow-up question. Uh, Jim said what we need to do is test uh, Kim Jong-un's sincerity. Uh, in four sentences or less, Jim, how, how do we do that? And then I will ask the others the same question. Well, I think the first thing, obviously, is um, I don't think President Trump has directly heard from Kim Jong-un what he's been told by President Moon. So it's important for him to have those conversations himself and get a sense of what, uh, what Kim Jong-un is thinking, but then to go through some of the steps that would be needed and some of the uh, inducements that the United States and others might be willing to produce. So I think starting to explore and have that conversation to see how realistic uh, Kim Jong-un is is something that's very important. Okay, uh, Chi Yu, how, yes. how, do, how do we test Kim Jong Un's sincerity? Well, uh, based on the uh, pre, uh, based on the consensus they have reached with uh, President Xi, President Moon, and President Trump, the following negotiations will be a real test for North Korea's uh, sincerity about the denuclearization. Uh, we have uh, we have witnessed. Uh, up and down about their slogan of the denuclearization during the Kim Jong Il uh, period, they say keep saying they kept saying denuclearization, but meanwhile they kept doing something nuclearization, and during the past the previous five years on the Kim Jong Un, they threw away uh, his father's uh, uh, principle, say nuclearization as a national strategy. Now they suddenly say denuclearization again. Uh, few people believe the sincerity. However, two points, uh, we, must put, uh, we must take two points in our, into our consideration. Number one, um, no matter he like or dislike the denuclearization, I believe North Korea has to go the denuclearization simply because their national, uh, their national security cannot be guaranteed 
by nuclear weapon. I repeatedly told my North, friend, North Korean friend, I said, you always say nuclear weapon as a deterrence. Yes, nuclear weapon can guarantee your national security. However, your national regime, national uh, security cannot only uh, cannot be guaranteed only by nuclear weapon. Fundamentally, a sustain, sustainable, solid economy is the base for the security, for the regime's sustainable existence. So they understand that. That is why now they make a big strategic, uh, strategic focus shift from the Beijing policy to single focus on economic development. They made a decision recently ago. That is their must, but that is the international community's uh, chance or opportunity. See, so they have to develop their nuclear, uh, they have to develop their economy, but if they continue their uh, fake denuclearization, they will kill their economy. For example, during the, uh, during the past five years, they made a lot of achievements about uh, nuclear development. But every progress in nuclear and uh, missile means a huge opportunity cost for their economic development. During the past four years, Kim Jong-un ordered to set up numerous special economic zones between 2013 to mm. 2017. They set up uh, 25 more zones, but uh, all of the zones remain zero, simply because of the increasing pressures and the sanctions and so on. No trade and uh, no uh, investment. So they have to make a choice between the two, develop nuclear or develop the economy. So that is the objective trend they cannot resist. And secondly, um, under the current pressures, the opportunity cost will become a very strong leverage for our side, for the international community. And uh, the, the only problem or question for North Korea is, where is the opportunity? Opportunity cost is, is true, but where is the opportunity? So for our side, we need to cre create a architecture under which uh, North Korea can understand clearly if they go wrong direction, nuclearization, they will face and go into dark future. If they go right direction, they can have a bright future. So what we need is on one hand, we need to maintain the existing uh, UNSC uh, sanction regimes. And on that hand, we need to, through negotiations, to design a, a path, uh, encourage North Korea mm. go a sincere denuclearization for their bright future. So, so I think only when we go the thoughtful and the balanced way, then we can uh, solve the nuclear issue in peaceful manner. Right. Yuki, how do we test this sincerity? Very simple. Um, the way to test uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, Mr. Kim, is sincere or not? I think Mr. Trump should ask Mr. Kim Jong-un, are you willing to go in front of camera and say publicly, you are committed to denuclearize? Plain and simple. Because we have all heard South Korean emissary heard him say it, or someone so heard him say it, but none of us have heard him personally say it. That will be the test of the sincerity to me. David? I think early in the process, we'll need to get inspectors into North Korea, and they'll have to have the widest possible access. I think the North Koreans will have to make a, a declaration on their past nuclear activities, and will have to put in place a very, very strong verification regime. It was over verification, I believe, that the uh, six-party process during the George W. Bush administration foundered. So this is going to be verification at the end is going to be a key piece of the, the, uh, the puzzle, I believe. Uh, in order, the first step would be face-to-face -face conversation between um, the two governments at whatever level. Um, it's fine if we have several summits. I think that's okay. It's better than reverting back to the past several years of trying to read each other through public statements and posturing, because uh, you don't get the entire picture by just reading each other across the ocean through the printed word. 
The second step would be to uh, record that discussion um, and whatever so-called agreements came out of it, whether it's in the form of a joint statement, communique, agreement, uh, what have you. The third would be um, to see if and how and for how long uh, Kim Jong-un sticks to and complies with um, the so-called agreements that were uh, made between the two sides uh, in action and not just through words. Uh, but finally, the ultimate test uh, would be uh, what David mentioned is full access to international inspectors, which means allow international inspectors to go anywhere they want in North Korea to inspect their facilities and fissile materials and weapons uh, and to be able to verify them at will. Thank you very much. Uh, I have about 30 more questions I'd like to ask, but we want to give the audience a chance to uh, ask your own questions. So I would, uh, we have, I think, a couple of people with roaming mics. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please, a couple of ground rules, if you would identify yourself uh, address it either to the panel at large or to a specific speaker, and don't make your question longer than their presentations. Uh, and I, I see a hand right here uh, in the middle, this young lady. Okay. Hi, so I'm Sikh Meath and I work, I'm interning at the UN, UNICEF. A little and my closer, question please. Yes, and my question is, um, well, we've been reading in the news how uh, the NRA Bolton said that we're going to follow the Libyan model, um, and I think that sort of like makes, um, and rightfully so, the North Korean president really anxious. So what are your views about that? Like, is, like would they follow the Libyan model? And I think the talks, are they saying we're not going to have the talks because it seems like a risk factor? So just wanted to hear, and it's open to everyone, so whoever wants to answer. Thank you. Was that at anybody in particular, or I'm going to stick David initially with it, uh, the Libya model, essentially? Well, it certainly ticked the North Koreans off, didn't it? Um, they came back last week and said they don't like the Libya model, and they're not going to denuclearize. Um, I'm not certain how uh, firm they were, were in that. The North Koreans always like to conduct a negotiation before the actual negotiations, and I think that's what they were doing. But I, I do think that um, Mr. Bolt, Ambassador Bolton's choice of words was infelicitous, and I don't think comparing what we want to do with North Korea to the Libya to Libya is is the right way to encourage the North Koreans to come to the table. Do you yeah, it was a mistake for him to say that uh, because that just tells the North Koreans, give up your nukes and we're going to go in and we're going to invade you and kill you and get rid of your regime and leadership. Uh, so that was a big mistake. Uh, what was a positive outcome actually was that President Trump walked that back. Uh, and so, you know, that, that might be a bit reassuring for the North Koreans to hear the President of the United States say that, especially because their own system operates in, this, in the manner in which where the top leader's um, word is everything. Um, but the other mistake there with um, Bolton was you just can't compare because Libya's uh, nuclear programs was nothing compared to where North Korea's programs are right now. So in, all, in every sense of it, it was just a bad comparison. Should you? Uh, but for North Korea's uh, point of view, the term of Libya model uh, is not only unacceptable, but also contains some meaning of humiliation. Libya model, this is not the first time to raise the uh, concept of Libya model by the United States. More than 10 years ago, during the Sixth Party talks, uh, American delegation formally raised this suggestion, say, Let's solve the North Korean nuclear issue by Libya model. At that time, Qaddafi regime submitted all the nuclear stuff, including the uh, materials and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, everything. Um, North Korea opposed. And a few years later, the uh, regime was, was uh, killed. The, the, the leader was killed. So through that case, North Korea publicly said, the lesson we draw from the Libya model was the result Libya f faced. And uh, furthermore, uh, in the joint statement made by the six parties in 2005, in one of the article, the draft was said, I was the drafter of the joint statement. Originally, the wording was like, like this. 
all the parties uh, should co uh, uh, should uh, should be in peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence. And at the last minute, say the date of September 19, 10 minutes before we go into the plenary session for the pass of the documents, and a phone call made from Washington, D.C. to Beijing. And uh, the then Secretary of State, Connie Rice, strongly instructed the American delegation to revise the term of peaceful coexistence. The reason was very strange. She said, during the Cold War era, the Soviet uh, requested and argued, negotiate and bargain for the term with the US, peaceful coexistence. And the US didn't give the term with the Soviet, let alone to the North Korea. That was the year of 2005. And finally, for the passage of the uh, uh, documents, we have to revise the words. Uh, finally, we say uh, all countries uh, coexist in peaceful manner. But uh, what, well, anyway, we revised under American request. That small case really alerted North Korea plus the Libya model. So this time, when senior official from Trump administration re raise this concept, they really re-alarmed. I think that is the reason why Pyongyang suddenly sent very negative uh, tones about uh, the uh, senior level bilateral relation, uh, bilateral meeting between the two Koreas. They even threatened to cancel the summit meeting in Singapore. So in short, Libya model uh, is not a constructive one under the current situation. Just very quickly, um, of course, the National Security Advisor could have uh, selected different wording rather than Libya model. We all kind of understand what that involves. But at the same time, I think they are also testing how desperate uh, President Trump is to get this summit. And, and I think it was quite wise for him to it was a little bit embarrassing for President Moon today, but he said, if conditions are not right, we, we, we may not, we may postpone it. But he still doesn't use the word cancel. Um, but I think it was, uh, so, so surprisingly, I think uh, Mr. Trump's uh, response to this was more um, toned than, um, than I would have actually um, anticipated. <clears throat> do, you want, do you have an additional comment? Oh, no, I just had a really quick two finger of what Mr. Sure. Young said uh, about the language of peaceful coexistence and causes coexist peacefully in the 2005 joint statement. Um, the actual backstory there was uh, that Condoleezza Rice, being a Soviet expert, she said this is a Cold War concept to say peaceful coexistence. And so that's why they changed it to coexist peacefully instead. So there wasn't, there was really no conspiracy theory behind um, the, the language of that back then. Anyone who's ever been involved in drafting a government document knows just how much fun it is uh, when happy has to change to glad before we can move forward. Uh, yes, uh, this gentleman, well, we'll go to, yeah, sir, if you can stand up and then they'll hand you a mic. Here, here's a microphone coming to you. Uh, Jim Tripp. Um, it seems to me it's conceivable if Japan, South Korea, China, and the United States agree that in exchange for denuclearization, they will provide maximum economic assistance, trade, and everything else to assure the rapid modernization of the North Korean economy. And on the other hand, if they agree, total sanctions. Those are the two choices. And I guess my question is, it seems to me a conceivable outcome is that China would be sufficiently impressed with the progress being made that it would relax the sanctions, or maybe some other country would. But I'm just wondering if you agree with the overall concept. Is it possible for the four countries to have that kind of a stand and make it very clear. I, I think South Korea has already made that promise in the, in the North-South Declaration of a, a week or so ago, but. Uh, yeah, so 
uh, it, it's it's clear, it's it's no secret at all that both Beijing and Seoul um, are waiting until they really want the sanctions lifted. Um, for South Korea, it's to continue. Um, part of the umbrella of the peace initiative is uh, to bring back online uh, into Korean economic projects that have been severed for a long time now. And so they need that those sanctions to be lifted uh, for China for other obvious reasons too. Uh, but the danger that um, I would sound in your framing of the issue or the, the option is if you try to flood the North with financial and economic um, um, aid uh, and goodies, uh, the concern is that you'll end up with um, a very modern, economically modern and developed North Korea that still has nuclear weapons. Um, and China's way of thinking is like this. Uh, economic, uh, say, compensation or assistance is not the key elements. The key elements is the security concern. Uh, we always argue if we really want North Korea to give up completely, irreversibly, all nuclear weapons. First thing first is how to persuade North Korea to do it in confidence. They keep asking themselves, what if the nuclear weapon uh, is given up? Libya or Iraq or what else? So basically, uh, we insist on the two musts. Must one. North Korea must abandon or give up completely all nuclear weapons and the related programs and the materials. And uh, simultaneously, number two, the international community, our five countries in the Sikh Party framework, must address North Korea's legitimate concerns in security, political, economic, and the diplomacy. So only when we go through the two masts fairly and balancedly, then uh, we will be able to uh, uh, go uh, achieve the denuclearization. Good. So Jim, how concerned are you that uh, the US will say, we haven't seen enough yet to release uh, or ease up, uh, but that Korea and China and others will feel that they have seen it in this current solid front of, of sanctions that will start disintegrating. Yeah. No, uh, thank you, Rob. That's a very um, uh, real concern, a concern I have and I think shared by a lot of Americans is what if there is divergence in approach between the United States on the one hand and some of our allies on the other. My guess is probably the Japanese government would be very close to the US on this issue. I'll let Yuki comment on that. But that's why the point I made was my uh, definition of success in the case where Kim Jong-un is not sincere is that the United States work very hard to retain the support of China, uh, Republic of Korea, and Japan in order to implement our strategy of uh, continuing sanctions pressure and also to deter and contain North Korea because those policies depend on uh, uh, international collaboration. Uh David, we haven't mentioned Russia at all in this. Is, is Russia a player? Do we have to worry about the, the Russians trying to fill in? I've had Chinese complain that if the Chinese really cut back, that the Russians will fill the void. And uh, is, Are they a factor in this? That's a good question. I, I don't think the Russians are a critical factor. I think they uh, are f on the sidelines, but um, they could play an important spoiler role in an agreement. In general, I think um, the Russians and the Chinese have an understanding which requires the Chinese basically to support Russia in Europe. And it requires that Russia basically support the Chinese in East Asia, sort of a general rough gentleman's agreement, you might say. Um, that said, Russia has taken uh, the opportunity to um, help provide North Korea with items that are sanctioned under UN Security Council resolutions. And I think that continues to be possible as, as we move forward. But in general, I, I think Rus Russia is more or less of a bit player. Okay. Uh, there was a, yes, right here. This. Uh, hello. 
My name is Hee Yoon Kim, and this is for all of you. Speak really loud. Pretend you're at a karaoke. (laughs) Sing it out. My name is Hee Yoon Kim, and this is for all of the speakers. My question is, actually it's happening right now that the journalists from each country, uh, UK, Korea, Japan, I'm sorry, China, and United States, are in Wonsan right now to witness the destruction of the test sites uh, in North Korea located in Punggye-ri. And I thought, after reading the news, it was pretty strong uh, commitment and the demonstration of the government's commitment to give up its nukes. And we briefly just talked about Kim Jong-un's sincerity, how sincere he is before the summit to give up the nukes and how serious he is in the conversation. So my question is, isn't that pretty much big of a uh, commitment that they're making uh, enough for us to actually see it in a more positive light. And if I may ask one more thing, why do you think it was only the Korean journalists who were banned to enter uh, into uh, the North Korea to cover the story? Because Koreans were initially invited too, but at the last minute, it got canceled. Okay. Do you want to start? Uh, the, first, the answer to your first question is no, it's not big. Um, closing Punggye-ri. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, the North does not think that it needs Punggye-ri anymore, uh, and it's just a symbolic gesture. It's, it's not the wrong move, but it does not mean uh, that the North is sincere about denuclearization. If it doesn't need it, it can get rid of it, and it doesn't mean anything. Uh, this brings back memories uh, of when, during the Six Party Talks, of when they blew up their cooling tower at Yongbyon. And it was the same thing. The cooling tower was dysfunctional. It served no purpose at all. Uh, And so they blew it up for symbolic purposes. Uh, In terms of Punggye-ri, you know, there are are conflicting reports. Some reports say that uh, the tunnels are not viable in Punggye-ri. There are others, like 38 North, uh, that say that some tunnels are still viable for um, nuclear or explosive uh, or um, nuclear explosions, nuclear testing. Uh, But see, if, if... The North does not think that Punggye-ri is needed. Uh, They're basically saying uh, that they have other ways of refining their nuclear technology. Uh, Either they, because they're such good um, tunnel diggers, they can have other tunnels that may be ready, or uh, they might be saying, they might be declaring essentially that they are a responsible advanced nuclear power. And say, because advanced nuclear powers after a certain point don't need to conduct explosive tests in order to f- refine their nuclear technology. They can conduct what we call lab scale subcritical nuclear testing. And so, um, so that basically means that the North is trying to, they might be um, implying or basically essentially saying, we are now a nuclear power, we have arrived, we don't need these tunnels anymore. And why are they not allowing South Korean journalists? You know, that's hard to, that's, yeah, I mean, I I don't know for sure. Um, That is surprising, especially under the current mood of um, such peaceful and euphoric and and festive (laughs) mood uh, on the Korean peninsula. Uh, But it's also not surprising, too. I mean, there's been, you know, in the past, um, or the history of of the divided Korean peninsula, there's always been that um, tension between the Koreas and, and just the North Koreans not... Um, thinking that um, South Koreans are really needed to be there. Anyone else want to add anything? Uh, you? Yeah, uh, I'm afraid that I have a different assessment. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, I really believe the, uh, the, the action of closing down the test site is a substantive action. And uh, out of my expectation, because North Korea always goes through the principle, say, action for action. And because you, the United States, is bigger than I, so you go first, and then I will follow. follow. That is the past 20 years uh, record. But this time, they do a unilateral action without any action from the United States. And uh, number one, I, I, I want to stress, after closing down this test site, for foreseeable future, North Korea will be never have a new nuclear tests. And I believe they haven't completed their nuclear development. Uh, for example, now the existing site remain have uh, two big, bigger tunnels that really reflected North Korea in their original plan. They did have uh, 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 preparations for more 
tests, but now they closed down. Of course, I agree that site has been dying already, not because none of the tunnel available, because the structure of the Earth's shell has been terribly damaged after a series of uh, nuclear tests. So that, that site has been uh, died. However, they have uh, two options. Option one, like always, just keep this, uh, no matter it's a substantive or uh, a symbolic uh, item, keep tail to the negotiation table, bargain for Americans' action. Then I can throw away this side. That's option one. And option two, unilateral action threw it away. And they do option two, simply because they want to pay a down payment for their credit to show they are sincere, although few people believe the sincerity. But that is a really substantive action far before the bargaining negotiation started. So I think this action is a really positive signal for the Singapore meeting. We, I, look, uh, I regard the closing down action as a carrot, and the Pyongyang divide the one carrot into two parts. The small part has, uh, was given to President Moon during the Ban Menjiang uh, talks. He promised to close down. That's an oral commitment. And then before Singapore meeting, they do an action uh, by closing down. So basically, uh, no matter it's a symbolic or substantive, I believe it's substantive, that is a positive signal for the success of Singapore meeting. Thank you. Yuki, yeah, and um, then Jim. Uh, just very quickly, um, I, tend to I tend to agree with uh, Dayon when it, for the uh, significance of the uh, Pungiri uh, shut down, but uh, you just heard two, one, one action taken by North Korea, two very different inter interpretation between South Korea's side and China's Chinese side. And this is the crux of the difficulty of this problem, that what every single action or gesture that North Korea takes or may choose not to take, most likely will be interpreted differently in all these different capitals. And it is extremely difficult for all the parties concerned. In this case, I'm referring to South and North, South, South Korea, China, U.S., and Japan. And just to avoid Russia to play the spoilers for Russia, to be on the completely on the same page when it comes to the judgment on the sincerity of the North Korea. Therefore, what is considered appropriate or necessary or enough will is bound to be. Diverge, di diverge, and that is the uh, fundamental challenge of this issue. Good, good point, Jim. Yeah, I want to echo what Yuki said. You know, we, you've heard two very different points of view on the meaning of this action, and I think that highlights the point that David Shear made earlier that leaders' talks are important, but we need some concrete steps. And the first one would be a North Korean declaration of its nuclear programs, which we could then check against what we know. And secondly, it would be verification and then some in inspections. And what I hope we could say a year from now is we know a lot more about the situation in North Korea and a better evaluation as to what these steps mean. But this shows how difficult it is because there's a lot of things we don't know. And until we have these kind of um, uh, much more uh, transparency, it's going to be very difficult to evaluate what steps like this actually mean. It's also useful to remember that Kim Jong-un in his New Year's address said uh, my testing of both nuclear weapons and ICBMs are complete. What we're going to focus on this year is producing more weapons and producing more missiles. So while we're talking about the halt of testing and all, we ought to take him at his word and uh, make sure that we address that aspect uh, when we sit down and, and talk with him. But this gentleman right here had his hand up. And then I'll look on this side of the room. If there's anyone, please. My name is Errol Rutman. And I'd like to address this to uh, Mr. Yang. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, we can't, can't hear, you hear you at all. If you could, my name is Errol Rudman, and I'd like to address this to Mr. Yang. I, I listened to your description of the importance of, of economic stability and an inf economic infrastructure as a predecessor and stabilizer 
for the North Korean government so that they're assured of their own longevity. And then examples were brought up of the Libyan uh, demise, uh, Gaddafi's demise. But I'd like to just point out that uh, his demise was not caused by the Americans. It was caused by his leadership within his own country and the instability of the rights that people have or the lack of rights that people have. And when a dictatorship is weakened, as this might be, uh, might, might this only serve to feed his own sense of paranoia? Yeah. And I, I didn't hear a question in there, so I'm going to look for any other question. question. Yeah. My, my question was, do, does this cause, does he accept the causality, and, and how would he alter the plans so that it will her right. in that way. She, she you, do you, you have a, a quick response to that? In that uh, uh, a quick, a quick, a quick response. Um, North Korea draw a lesson as a conclusion say, if Gaddafi regime commanded nuclear weapon, they, uh, he would be, uh, he would not be killed. And uh, if Saddam Hussein commanded a nuclear weapon, the regime won't be killed. So that is the conclusion, no matter what reason caused the killed uh, uh, incidents. And the conclusion by North Korea is the nuclear weapon is a useful, reliable deterrence uh, deterring US from doing anything US wants. That is the key for the lesson drawn by Pyongyang. I mean, the reality is the Libya model, the Iran model, these other models are, are interesting things for academics to talk about, but the North Koreans don't see themselves as Libya or Iran or anyone else. So they sort of dismiss those models when they're working and just use them as an excuse when they're not. Uh, but they see themselves as, as very unique and, and go in that direction. Uh, all the way in the, the back over here. This, this gentleman with the, a, a white jacket, or if you could stand up, sir, and then somebody with a mic can find you. This is Tom Miller. Just a quick question. If the, uh, we're talking a lot about the possible success of the uh, negotiations or not. But um, uh, I'm just wondering if, the, if these negotiations don't work either in the short or lo uh, uh, longer term, what are the dangers of uh, an actual conflict, particularly since the Trump administration has been very clear that a military option has always been on the table? So I was just wondering if this thing doesn't work out, um, uh, how serious is that kind of a possibility, a military option, uh, p perhaps initiated by the United States? Good, thank you. Since we're running very close to the end of time, I'll just, if there are another couple of questions, this gentleman right here, I'll, I'll just collect a couple of questions and then we'll go for a final round from the audience, uh, from the panel, please. Hi, Jeff Harris. I, I've heard a lot of questions or answers or opinions about what each of you would like and our countries want. I think the, the question is, what does he want? I mean, I, I think it's uh, preservation his regime potentially, uh, and maybe he enjoys his lifestyle and has some respect, and he's gotten those things. So the, the question is, what do you think he wants? Number one, and number two, to the question above, what what guarantees can you provide to him that he'll his regime will survive if he does denuclearize? I think he is very concerned about what happened in Libya. I think it is a very good model. It's probably what he's looking at. I haven't heard anything about what promises would be given back. Very good question. And I saw another hand all the way in the, in the back, this young lady, if you wouldn't mind standing, and I can find you. Here, come, here comes a mic. In fact, here comes a couple of mics. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the mics. Uh, my name is Maiko Takeuchi. I'm working for the DPR, uh, New North Korean Sanction Regime in the uh, United uh, Nations. I have a quick question about, like, uh, so uh, my, for me, denuclearization is one thing, but if you see the, the, all the sanction, there's all other issues, like a 
bio, biochemical weapon. The, as Ms. Tatsumi says, Japan has a concern about short and medium range missile. And also when you turn on the, you know, the people there, you know, the, the human rights issue are not solved yet. And like if you, so my question is, so is, isn't it too early for the international community to think about the lift sanction, especially uh, leaving a lot of issues? And I have a particular question to Ms. Takumi. How Japan can act to pursue Japan's concerns, for example, of the national security issues and abduction issues or other uh, still not to be touched issue? To, uh, to persuade other friendly countries to uh, re realize Japan's uh, concern issues. Good. I, I know there are other questions out there, but I'm going to go back to the panelists at this point uh, and add one last question, which is, what question did you wish somebody would have asked you so that you could, <laughs> you could have given that great answer you had prepared? So. We're going to start with Jim and just work our way down uh, to the panelists. And if you take about two minutes each, we'll end right on time. Jim. OK. Um, regarding the question on the military option, um, obviously th that's something that can't be ruled out. But I would, even if the summit does not result in a process moving forward on denuclearization, I would argue the United States and its friends has other options. And certainly, strengthening the sanctions regime to um, uh, change North Korea's mind. That requires patience as well as cooperation. That's not something we're good at as Americans. It won't be something that'll last for a week or a month, but I think that would be a preferable option. Um, what does Kim Jong-un want? I think you're right, he wants survival, but I think he also recognizes that economic growth and economic development in North Korea is an essential component of survival. So he's interested in um, seeing whether, uh, whether he can obtain more resources from, out, from outsiders. And finally, I agree completely with the, um, I'm glad someone, that answers Ralph's question, is, well, what did you wish we had asked? And I wish someone had asked about human rights and you did at the end, so thank you very much. It's something that's of great concern to the United States, um, not only um, North Korean uh, treatment of North Korean citizens, but also North Korean treatment of people who were abducted uh, overseas and brought back to North Korea. So I don't see the United States government issuing some kind of blanket guarantee uh, to the Kim Jong-un regime without some kind of discussion on human rights issues that would be not uh, in accord with our own values. Xu? Um, uh, number one, uh, war option should be off the table. China will definitely oppose any kind of military actions uh, addressing the North Korean nuclear issue. And uh, number two, what really North Korea wants, let me put by, by this way, what China really wants we want a political stability, economic prosperity, but without nuclear weapon, North Korea. I think that is the benefits of North Korea. Of course, that is one of North Koreans want. But uh, returning to your question, uh, your question reminded me of an article uh, written by two American professors uh, back in you know, more than 10 years ago after the two professors visited Pyongyang. And they issued an article uh, with uh, North Korea's uh, 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 agreement. Uh, the, 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 the title of the article in the Washington Post is what North Korea really wants, exactly the question you raised. Uh, the article argued North Korea wants to uh, set up a equal footing strategic um, cooperation relationships, uh, equal footing strategic partnership with the United States. So that is what North Korea want, uh, expressed by uh, two American visitors after their meeting with a very senior level of the DPRK state. Thank you. Good. Yuki? Great. Um, so if the uh, talk summit doesn't go well, a uh, negotiation that unfolds it, uh, that, that may or may not follow afterwards doesn't fall well. Uh, with this particular American administration, I do think that uh, military option is very realistically on the table. I don't know what that will look like. I think that is DOD is 
probably noodling at this minute also. But uh, that should, that, that would really test Japan, um, US alliances in Northeast Asia, not only with, uh, of course, with uh, South Korea, but then also with uh, Japan, big time. So hopefully that will, that will not come to that, and hopefully uh, what the alternative option that Jim outlined uh, would work appropriately. Uh, because the uh, last question was uh, posed to me, uh, how can Japan uh, um, address its security concern as well as the uh, human, uh, its abduction issue? The, uh, the bottom line is, can Japan come up with a proactive definition of what that complete and full resolution, resolution of the abductee abduction issue looks like minus the absolute return of the uh, 12 that are identified? Realistic, it, it is an emotionally charged issue. When you're, if you, if you think about it, if a member of the family just kind of disappeared in front of you and then just kept missing for decades, you don't want to believe that they're died. They're, they're, they have passed away. But at this point, there, there ought to be some way for Japan to be able to outline that, what that resolution of what the resolution might look like without the uh, return of all those 12 people. Only then, I think Japan can fully leverage the uh, incentive package that they have to offer, technical assistance it has to offer, and uh, it can really now work proactively with the United States and perhaps with South Korea on uh, what kind of uh, denuclearization process that could, uh, that, that could unfold with Japan's, uh, Japan's engagement. David, no one, no one has addressed the question, why should Kim Jong-un trust us, or how can we get him to trust us? If you have any thoughts on that, that would be uh, good. I think that's the question of the hour. I think that's a fundamental question. Is there anything that will satisfy Kim Jong-un's craving for security that doesn't involve his possession of nuclear weapons? And I think uh, the answer is we don't know for sure, but we have to try and find something. Um, and I think that will involve strong assurances, not only from the United States, but from China as well. And how that is formulated, I don't know yet, but I, I think China has to be a part of making North Korea feel more secure. It's not just a pledge of dropping our hostile, the United States, whatever North Korea means by the, the US hostile policy toward North Korea. China has to be a part of it. Duyan, and there was also a question about should Ken Bio right. capabilities be out there? Maybe you can address that as well. Uh, sure. Uh, the short answer is yes to the biochem, human rights, all that. Um, that needs to all be on the table. Um, for the first question of what happens if negotiations fail, uh, and the concerns of the military option, uh, it really depends on who acts first and how they act and how that would cause the other party to react. Uh, and so if the North reverts to its traditional behavior of um, if it's upset in negotiations and it walks away and it goes um, tests something, whether it's a missile or a nuclear device, uh, then that will surely, um, all doors will close and will, that'll spike, es like, most likely spike escalation. But if neither side provokes each other, um, that would actually be a very good outcome uh, and just <laughs> and have just a very tense situation, but just no one does anything. Um, but I wouldn't really be betting on that. Um, but another good, actually another good outcome would be that, um, that the Trump administration reverts to continuing with um, maximum sanctions, or we like to call it uh, sanctions on steroids, uh, and deterrence and containment that Jim had uh, mentioned before. What does North Korea want? Uh, survival, prosperity, security, and under a Kim Jong-un era, based on their actions and, and comments, it seem, it's pretty clear they want um, the status of a nuclear power on equal footing with the United States. I don't have the last burning question that I wanted to be asked. But I would say, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, everybody wants peace. So you hear and read a lot about, you know, the peace um, agenda and declaring an end to the war and peace treaty, and that's all great. Um, but the issue is um, peace treaty should never be signed before um, denuclearization, complete denuclearization. Uh, and 
um, there's always that a concern that nuclear negotiations or denuclearization negotiations will be will be held hostage to peace negotiations. Uh, and so um, the concern there is the North will try to maneuver and manipulate and try to speed up the peace process first before the, the nuclear the nuclearization process. And so these are some um, very um, you know complex and tricky uh, elements that are all at play right now. And, and finally, let me just point out as a, as a former military planner myself uh, that military options do not just include 500,000 troops marching on Pyongyang to end uh, the regime. Uh, military options also include uh, stopping and seizing ships on the open sea, something that's already happened in, in some areas, uh, blockades, other types of, of military pressure. Uh, there are also uh, a number of things, I, I think if you talk to some of the hardliners uh, of our group, they will say, uh, you, you haven't even seen extreme pressure yet, that, that there's an awful lot of other things we can do uh, politically, financially, economically that would really uh, tighten the screws or efforts that uh, psychological operations aimed at a regime destabilization. Uh, so there are still a lot of arrows uh, in the quiver uh, beyond having to march on Pyongyang. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't be seeing this as sort of an either or, either this thing is successful or we're going to go to war. Uh, I think it's more likely we would go back to doing the types of pressure and then just increase that. And there are many options for increasing that short of uh, a massive military operation. Uh, our, our one task was to make sure we ended on time and, and it's eight o'clock. So I would ask you to please join me in, in thanking our panelists. <laughs>